Support for this podcast comes from our Indiegogo campaign, the Friends and Family Foundation, the Visa and MasterCard Foundation, the We Weren't Planning to Eat That Much Food Anyway Foundation, and viewers like you. We're gonna help a lot of folks by playing games and telling jokes. We'll do some good while having fun. And broadly speaking, it's a pun. Get it? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your hosts for the premiere episode of Broadly Speaking, Analea Arnold and Kate Lur. <laughs> That makes us feel good in all of our parts. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Kate Lure. And I'm Analea Arnold. Welcome to Broadly Speaking, episode one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a show where we tell some jokes, tell some stories, and play a game the contestant is destined to lose. All to help someone who's helping someone else. Tonight's show benefits the Eamon Cannon Comedy Project at Inner City Arts. <laughs> So, we have a fantastic lineup of guests who are all here to prove the power of using comedy to deal with your sheep. <laughs> but first, please let's welcome our broadband, introducing the strip mall debutantes. <laughs> and congratulations to Susan Shackelford Dawes for winning our Name the Band contest. Thank you, Susan. Yes, you've won infamy and two tickets to a future show. So, good job. <laughs> and while we're thanking people, we want to thank all of you in the audience tonight and those of you watching on the YouTube who donated to our Indiegogo campaign. We wouldn't be here without you, so thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. When other people put their faith in you, it makes it a lot harder to give up. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and giving up can be a tempting option sometimes. Particularly when things get hard, because when things get hard, giving up looks easy. And a lot of times, it's easier to do the thing that's easy than it is to do the thing that's hard. That's just science. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you do want to give up, it can be hard to do it, especially if you want to do it right. Our first performer this evening knows all about giving up. She is a writer for At Midnight on Comedy Central, and her hilarious book, Recipes for Disaster, includes fun chapters like learning to love yourself again after serving runny polenta. Something I think... <laughs> <laughs> something we've all had to grapple with. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Ms. Tess Rafferty. I just love the intro. Our next performer knows all about giving up. She's a writer. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it was intentional or not, I'm going to pretend it was intentional because I love it like that. Okay. I used to have some notion that there were people like Jedi, Jedi masters, but with better wardrobes, who would tell you in life the things that you needed to hear. Here's the inherent flaw, though. People are just as fucked up as you. <laughs> Why do we think they have something important to say that's going to make our lives better? Oh, sure, you can say, but what about the feedback, nay, criticism, necessary to improve in your job? Let me just say that this is all horse cock, too. <laughs> I once had a friend read a spec script I had written. Now, I don't want to date myself by telling you which so, so let's just say it was from my mother, the car. <laughs> Is that too obscure? Okay, how about welcome back, Cotter? <laughs> so said professional read my script and said that I had written a phrase that Mr. Cotter would never say. That's feedback. Two months later, I saw Mr. Cotter use the exact same <laughs> phrase that someone said he would never say. That's horse cock. <laughs> For sake of argument and to prove out my theory, Let's just suppose that my friend, who was a very talented working professional with expertise in his field, was correct. Let's say Mr. Cotter would never utter those words that are written, and in fact hadn't uttered the same phrase two months later. So fucking what? Maybe he was right. But we've all had experience knowing that we were right about something and seeing it break the other way. We've all seen people who've lacked the necessary skills, experience, heartbeat to get a job, and yet go on to get that very same job they do. We 
We live in a world in which Aaron Sorkin continues to be thought of as a genius after Studio 60. <laughs> Anything can happen. So whether or not someone's criticism is right or wrong, so fucking what? And why in the name of all that is holy do we have people who are paid to do this professionally? It's not like Alfonso Cuaron is going to say, you know what, E.W. was right, my dialogue is a little stilted. Maybe I should take a few years off and work on that instead of making a movie that grosses hundreds of millions of dollars. He can't go back and change that film. And what tiny percentage of people are still looking to critics to guide them at the movie theater like some sort of social sensei? But what is the point of critics? And I say this as someone who has been reviewed and usually well. But there is one kind of criticism that is so despicable and reprehensible. It is the pedophilia of criticism. <laughs> Self-criticism. What makes self-criticism particularly diabolical is that I know I don't have the answers. If I had them, I wouldn't be in this pickle. And yet I persist, persist in doing the criticizing anyway. It's like I think there must be some magical formula for the amount I need to beat myself up in order to take away the sting of being wrong to begin with. Now shitheads will tell you that some amount of self-criticism is good because you can learn from your mistakes. <laughs> but can you? <laughs> It's not like the exact same situation is going to present itself over and over again, like your Bill Murray and Groundhog's Day. Each situation in life is unique and you have to blindly try to not fuck it up. You can do the right thing and lose or do the wrong thing and by dumb luck come out unscathed. So, just to review, people know nothing, you know nothing, dumb people sometimes get ahead. So, if it's all futile, why bother? I mean, why bother indeed? That's exactly the position I found myself in last summer when I decided to give up. <laughs> give up what, you may ask? Everything. <laughs> See, eventually what I'd learned from my mistakes was that the only way to stop failing was to stop trying. <laughs> Of course, people could, could have tried to stop me, and I could have told them I made up my mind, but I'd given up arguing with people. <laughs> Engaging you in some kind of debate about why my day-to-day -day endeavors are futile would imply that even my arguing with you serves some purpose, and that would not be giving up. Now, this may sound to some like depression, <laughs> but depression is for people with hopes and dreams. <laughs> I had given those up. <laughs> I mean, for years, I'd been contemplating giving up several aspects of my life multiple times a day. Giving up drinking, giving up trying to give up drinking, <laughs> you know, deciding to give up sugar and carbs, and then deciding to stop caring about what I'd look like if I didn't. <laughs> Things like giving up drinking require work. You have to go to meetings and take up hiking or knitting or something, I don't know. And all of this really flies in the face of giving up. To really give up, you have to give up caring about everything. Except recycling, because I just can't do it. I just keep thinking, where is it all going? <laughs> so there I was giving up. I would watch the same episode of a TV show two days in a row. I saw episodes of Arrested Development three times in 24 hours. I read great books in a day. I read shitty books in a day. I took naps without setting the alarm. I just got into bed and thought, okay, let's just see what happens. <laughs> it was like having a fever except without the chills. All my life I fought giving up. Why? When you give up, you can spend your afternoons watching TV without thinking about the 17 other things you should be doing with your time. You don't trick yourself into thinking you'd have that Oscar by now if it wasn't for all these SVU marathons. <laughs> Besides, that sounds suspiciously like criticism. As we all know, criticism is, criticism is a load of donkey dung. I even bought the dress I was gonna give up in. It was this poochy-esque caftan, and I planned to just give up my career and float around the house talking to my cats and listening to Serge Gainsbourg with a glass of Sancerre in my hand at all hours of the day. <laughs> See, even my giving up contains such elements of fantasy that my real life of giving up was never going to measure up to it. 
Someday I'd have to force myself to give up my fantasy of giving up. It was only one more thing for me to fail at. And then I would criticize myself for failing at what was essentially already failing. The other problem with giving up is that you have to keep going. You can't give up giving up. You've, we've all given up for brief periods of time to realize that after the fact that now we have to work twice as hard to catch up or lose our giving up weight. <laughs> and that's the exact reason we gave up, like the exact opposite reason why we gave up to begin with. We give up because we're tired of working at things. But in order to be successful at giving up, you have to give up, you have to keep giving up. And eventually that's a lot of work. If you followed any of that, you're high. <laughs> I gave up everything because I told myself that I just wasn't good at anything and that I was secretly a sham. And at the end of the day, I'm a sham when it comes to giving up. Do you remember the story a few years back when Whitney Houston was still alive? I know, God rest. <laughs> About how she had barricaded herself in a bathroom with only a crack pipe and like an army of dildos. <laughs> I swear this happened. <laughs> That is giving up, my friends. <laughs> the rest of us are mere amateurs. So let's review. People know nothing. You know nothing. Dumb people sometimes get ahead. And it's all futile, but you can't give up. Then what's to be done about criticism? What's to be done about the constant voices in our heads telling us everything we did wrong or should have done different and we're never going to do right anyway because we can't deal with the profound disappointment because we care so much? Is criticism a natural side effect of giving a shit? When my friend Mimsy points out that my Uggs have a hole in them and says that she can't believe I wore them out in public and asks why my headband is a different plaid than my shirt, it's just because she cares so much about me looking like a homeless person that she wouldn't want to be seen with. <laughs> When the husband says that I'm computer poison and shouldn't be allowed near technology, it's only because he knows that my computer is going to ruin our marriage. <laughs> Criticism is our way of saying, I wish I could have stopped this. But we couldn't. So we invoke criticism like a talisman against the unknown bad things that will happen to the ones we love in the future that we still won't be able to stop. If I point enough that could if I point out enough that could go wrong to you, I can keep you safe. And that's the real reason criticism is useless, because we can't keep them safe. And we can't always save ourselves. There is one proper place for criticism, however, and that's around a table with a couple of friends who are sharing a bottle of wine and a grudge against another human who is not there. <laughs> In that case, criticism is like a bomb. It's like a salve that you can rub all over your brain. <laughs> Wait, that's alcohol. Okay, then criticism is like a hug that you give yourself from the inside. Because nothing restores my faith in humanity like knowing that other people around me agree that we are superior to most of it, <laughs> even if we hate ourselves most of the time. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. I gave up trying to help. Oh, I find Tess so beautiful and talented that the fact that she ever gave up makes me feel so good about myself. <laughs> and the fact that she made comedy out of it is uh, even more enviable. Our next comic, Volunteers with girls who might very well be tempted to give up, but she does her best to combat that with comedy. Uh, she just got back from performing her hilarious one-woman show, Anne Frank Superstar, in New York to great <laughs> acclaim. Uh, you've seen her on Showtime and The Tonight Show and maybe at the Trader Joe's up the street. Please welcome to the stage, Betsy Salkind. <laughs> Wow, well, speaking of uh, people who are not qualified for their jobs, uh, I think that President Bush was evidence that maybe some children should be left behind. <laughs> 
but a lot of them should not. And that's who I work with. I um, I am a volunteer comedy teacher for at a residential facility for teen girls. And it's kind of amazing to me that I've been there now for three years because uh, I really never thought I would get past the first day. Um, my first day of class, uh, we got into a circle, or, you know, kind of, because I couldn't quite make that happen, but... Um, <laughs> And we played an improv game called Last Letter. And for those of you who don't know it, basically you just go around the circle and you say the first thing that comes to your mind, first word, and the only rule is that your word has to start with the last letter of the person before you, because that's supposed to keep you from planning in advance. So we're going around the circle, and one girl said barn, and the next girl said nigger, <laughs> and the next girl said asshole. <laughs> and I said... <laughs> Okay, uh, time out. Um, um, her word uh, ended with an R and yours started with an A. <laughs> and the second girl looked at me horrified, said, nigger, I said nigga. I was like, oh, well then asshole's fine, carry on. <laughs> That was day one. Um, this is not my real hair, by the way. It's, uh, I mean, it's my real hair, but it's not its natural state, because its natural state's really a big Jew-fro. But now I go to a black hairdresser so I can look Asian. And I tell you this because the girls think I'm Asian. And, well, you know, because they would always say, what are you? What are you? And, uh, you know, and I, well, you know, just a mix, a mix. And, um, and they kept saying, you, you're part Asian, right? I'm like, no, and you, no, you are Filipino, right? And finally, I just said, yes, I, I'm I, Filipino. <laughs> and she's like, I knew it. And so then I realized I'm going to have to keep this up. <laughs> like, you can't just say, no, I lied to you. Because these are kids who've been lied to their whole lives, you know. <laughs> So then I become Filipino for the rest of the time. And, th and here's the horrible thing is I realized they're gonna get out of there one day and they're gonna go on Facebook and they're gonna see that. So now I have to have fake Filipino family members <laughs> on my Facebook. You know, one of them asked me if I spoke Filipino. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I think it's just Spanish, right? <laughs> no. So now I have to learn Tagalog. <laughs> it's Tagalog, I, whatever. I don't, I don't speak that yet. I'm like 12th generation or something. I'm, I also am a math tutor there. Yeah, it's, not, it's really pretty easy. I just, you know, get together with them and I say, do the math. <laughs> you do the math, you know, that kind of thing. So one day they asked me, uh, a couple of them asked me if I had ever been a Girl Scout. And I said, no, uh, but I was a brownie. And, which I was. And several of them looked at me like this. What is that, some kind of racist thing? <laughs> I never thought of it that way. They, we did have the brown shirts and all. And, well, anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> there's nothing funny about that. Uh, actually, <laughs> when I tell people I'm a comedian, they always say, oh, are you funny? <laughs> I say, no, it's not that kind of comedy. <laughs> but here's the crazy thing is, you know, they would always want me to do some comedy for them to, you know, prove my, that I have something to teach them. And, and then they, I'd tell them my jokes and they would look at me like, oh, people laugh at that? <laughs> and so I started to do these shows at the house and I invite in professional comics and, and as time has gone on, some of the girls from the house as well, and we do shows um, at the house, and, uh, but I can only do a tiny bit of my act, which I'm gonna do for you now, and this is the part that they like, because they don't like my jokes. <laughs> you know, well, anyway, it turns out I, I okay, so, um, <laughs> they like my impressions. Do you like impressions? Yeah. Yeah. I don't do any, no. No, I do, and this is my impression of a seagull.
Thank you. I have a lot of free time. Okay, this is my impression of my cat sneezing. Thank you, I wrote that myself. And now the cat in heat. No, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna drag myself along the stage. Although they do make me do it. But anyway, uh, no, wait, uh, this, is, this is the male cat's response. I went to college. <laughs> All right, well, I'd like to just uh, close here with my favorite animal. <laughs> I haven't done it yet. <laughs> so, just, uh, I call it a squirrel. In Italy, it's El Scoyato. <laughs> and in New York, it's a fucking rat in a tree. <laughs> And it was so funny. funny. I agree. I really thought it was funny. funny. My favorite part was when the ladies made jokes. Yeah, that, that was a really good part. <laughs> so our next segment is one we've been calling Save the Starfish, which sounds very aquatic, but it's not. Have any of you heard the starfish story before? Oh, well, okay, for those of you who haven't, let me explain. It's an old parable that often gets usurped and modified to fit the purposes of whoever's telling it, and that's exactly what we've done. We've totally done that. So the story goes that there's a young girl walking down the beach, and she notices that hundreds of starfish have washed upon the shore, and they're dying out and drying. So one by one, she starts picking them up and throwing them back in. And then a man comes up to her. A grown man. A grown-ass man. And he says, <laughs> What are you doing? There are too many of them. You can't possibly save them all. Why bother? Why even?
even bother, says the grown-ass man who maybe forgot to take his Lexapro that day. <laughs> and the girl. The little girl. The mighty girl. Well, she picks up a starfish. Undaunted, undeterred. Throws it back in the water, looks at the man and says, it made a difference to that one. It made a difference to that one. <laughs> <laughs> and in some versions of the story. Some usurped versions. Like our version. The man is so touched that he starts helping her. And then other people see what they're doing, and they join in. And then eventually, all working together, they save the starfish. They save all the starfish. <laughs> see, sometimes it can feel like a problem is too big. And maybe you can't save every starfish, but it is definitely worth trying to save some. Because you never know. Those starfish might be the ones to maintain the ecological balance of nature by thinning biological excess, consuming carrion, and directly and indirectly maintaining an essential balance of underwater species. That's just science. <laughs> <laughs> that is just science. The point is, we can all make a difference with the tools, talents, and resources that we already have. And in fact, we're going to show you the story of a woman who's done just that. Take a look. My name is Susanna Spees, and I work with preteens and teens ages 11 to 18, teaching them comedy. The class is part of the Eamon Cannon Comedy Project in dedication to an amazing young comedian and mentor to other young students. We'll start telling some jokes, Mr. Bunny Boy. Stand-up comedy is a great way to express oneself and to share your opinions and to bond with others. That's a language everybody understands and wants to engage in. The name of the game in here, you guys, is to have fun. It's a nurturing environment where they can come together and say it how it is and they won't get in trouble for it. That's good. I want it to get loud. That's the biggest need that I see. Everybody has a voice that deserves to be heard. And it's an honor to provide that opportunity, especially to teens at risk, through our good friends at Inner City Arts who are hosting this program for us. She's not too intimidated with the fire. She's long, long, long. <laughs> We love the Eamon Cannon comedy class. It gives kids a safe space to express themselves, to see their ideas come to life. I was really struck with how similar the, just the focus and the mission of the class was to what our mission here at Inner City Arts is. This program here is fundamental. It's able to ca capture many youths' like attention and just distract them from the hustlers, the thugs, the drug dealers, but what are they thinking? They're thinking paint, color, they're thinking music, notes. The value of the program and the value of um, kids getting engaged in this art form, because it is an art form, surpasses what happens when they think they want to be a comedian. You don't have to be a performer to like comedy, you just have to be able to, you have an opportunity to be able to talk about what's on your mind. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. You pick a topic and then like you rant about that. 750. Yeah, you got the lettuce, tomatoes, fries, patty, <laughs> burger. A lot of those kids brought themselves here and created a set for themselves that was so representative of their voice of their thoughts, of their opinions, of their unique view on the world. I wasn't good enough to get robbed. <laughs> Two dollars wasn't enough for the man who had nothing. It's encouraging them to express themselves through writing. It's 90% writing. The writing is essential. Make things really specific. So like, normal people laugh at it because it's a stereotype. I laugh at it because it's my family. <laughs> That's a great line. You should write that. Write that, write that line. Down. Even though it's a fun comedy class, they really have to utilize those tools that are really critical for schools. When I started taking this class, I like started becoming funnier and funnier. And my English teacher like started to love my essays. So, like my grade went up to like a 97 or That's something. That's so awesome. Good. Comedy helps you find your place. You said you had felt weird when you read that. If you would sound more convincing, then the joke would have more like oomph. The art forms that you develop and you realize that you're good at are really an outlet for all the things that happen have happened to you. So you are who you really are in your art. And the reason I know that a lot of people have the ability to bring it out is because I brought mine out. And with a lot of help from people who love me and support me, I was able to be myself all the time. I'm drawing out who they are through the platform of comedy. So this is like a little thing um, called reveal, reveal yourself. yourself, where they say two things that are true and one thing that's false. And so then we have to guess what that is. Anything you say is gonna be right. I'm gonna throw things at you and you're gonna tell me how you feel about it. 
It's really clear that Susanna loves what she does and loves the kids. Very cool. High she five. just gives her heart to them in the form of encouragement. Yeah, you are really funny. We are so glad you're here. In the form of saying yes to their ideas and also guiding them and challenging them and asking their best of them. My heart's full of pepperoni and love. <laughs> the goal in this is not to try to make the next Seinfeld. The goal and the incentive in this is to have this be a vehicle for them to express themselves. Fancy. Welcome to the stage, Susanna Spees. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Thanks for being our first guest. Well, thank you for having me. Yay. So obviously we saw through the video, Susanna does stand up comedy and you teach kids how to make their own sets. So comedy is a big part of your life now. But what was comedy like in your life when you were a kid? Well, when I was in a, you know, I was sort of in a house that there wasn't a whole lot of comedy. Um, I had a very lovely upbringing, but, you know, uh, my dad was a professor, very academic and very smart, and school, school, school. And, uh, and my parents, you know, they were from another country, German, Chilean Jews from New Jersey. Anybody? <laughs> um, so uh, I think that the funny really came into sort of like dinners were never, you know, lunch wasn't peanut butter and jelly. It was like soy papillas, empanadas, you know, everything. <laughs> But it was really, um, I, I was kind of shy, and so I created my own comedy as much as I could, whether it was like, you know, salt and pepper shakers were two different characters or <laughs> different Barbie dolls. Um, I really started developing, I love to do character work, and so I sort of started divulging into that, and it wasn't until probably around high school, sophomore year in high school, that I started to really feel like, hey, there's something here, so. And that's the age of the kids that you work with now, right? Yeah. They're, what are their ages again exactly? Um, they're, they're between 10 and 19. So the average age is, is 13, but it goes all the way up to 19. Up to 19. And um, you met Eamon when he was taking classes with you in high school, and he really inspired this program because you saw how much it brought him out. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I was teaching a stand-up comedy class in Santa Monica, and, um, you know, Eamon, like, like many kids, you know, had a little bit of an aversion to school. Um, <laughs> Wasn't his favorite place to be. Um, but the day I started teaching stand-up, uh, he was never late from that day forward for six years. Um, he was a absolutely devoted student, an absolutely incredible writer. He became a mentor to others um, within not only that class, but he became um, a very, very huge, significant force within the world of comedy um, from the age of 15 to the age of 20. He was and that's part of the program as well, because I know Amita, who we saw on the video, was part of the program, and now he comes back and he mentors kids mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So starfish is putting more starfish out there. So. Maintaining the ecological balance. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, uh, the Eamon Cannon Comedy Project is currently housed at Inner City Arts, and that is located in the heart of Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles. It is well known for being one of the nation's most effective arts education providers to elementary, middle, and high school students, many of whom live in LA's poorest neighborhoods. And it gives them the tools and skills they need to succeed academically and personally. So can you tell us how long you've been at ICA? Uh, we are going into our sixth year. Six years? Yep. We started in 2008. And um, it's been very exciting. <laughs> you can talk. We can talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it's really cool. Um, I started there when I was 12, so it's good. Um, uh, no, it, it's been exciting because, we, you know, we, we started with five kids, and we've gone up, we've, we've, we've actually grown up to now, I think we've got 14 in our roster, so we're growing exponentially within the programs that we have there, and it's an incredible facility. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about the actual program? I mean, we saw a little bit on the video. We know that it lasts eight weeks, and that writing is involved, and that stand-up is involved, but tell us a little bit about how um, well, the program is, is actually 90% writing, and they develop their own material based on their own everyday experiences. So it's really, I think it's very important for teens to be able to have that platform. We know that there's a lot of angst. We know that there's a lot of 
different situations we're in, but you know a lot of things we don't know um, that they're experiencing every day. I've had students that have been living in a car or students that are affected by gang violence daily. They need that outlet. And so there's something called no blue, um, and that doesn't mean blue shorts, blue t-shirts, that doesn't mean the color. Um, they have to write and only perform things that are actually rated PG, so things that you can share with your family. Wow. So it culminates into a performance for the community to share in. Um, and it's half improvisation so that they learn you know, their tools with team building and working, and working together. And then the other half is, is actually developing their own material and then performing it after an, a culminating uh, eight-week progress so, pro a program so they, they, can, they can share in it and enjoy it. Well, thank you for joining us. We're going to hurry you off the stage because we want to get some money for you. So let's hear it for <laughs> Susanna Speed. Thank you. Oh, my belt just fell off. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. Extra. You said no blue. <laughs> segment is called The, the Game, Game is Rigged. For the kids at the Eamon Cannon Comedy Project at Inner City Arts, it can feel like the game is rigged against them because it is. Now Susanna is doing her part to help unrig the game, but we thought it would be fun to invite a guest to play a game to help her unrig it even more. If you watch the internet, you're probably already following our next guest on Twitter. He was the co-host of uh, he was the co-host of the Totally Rad Show, and he has a new project we're going to get to hear all about. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Jeff Kanata. Hey, that's me. Yeah. You guys are about me. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're gonna sit over here. You sit there. We. A fun little oh, this, is, this seat is quite lower than your seats. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, well you know. That's all right. So, thanks for coming in. Uh, first things first, what's happening on your face here? What's going on with that? Want to talk about that? Well, I'm trying a new eyeshadow. Oh, <laughs> you, you, you seem to have missed. Little. Oh, you mean the, the mustache? I'm doing a, I'm doing a play right now, uh, set in the 1930s, called the 39 Steps. So I had to draw. Ooh, somebody knows it. Oh, oh, uh, they said, yeah, it's good. It's full really disclosure, great. I have seen this play, and it is hilarious. Where might other people see this play? <laughs> <laughs> just take her word for it. Uh, it's, uh, it, it was playing at the uh, Norris Center, and we just closed. We had our final performance there on Sunday, but we're moving, good news! Yay! We're moving to uh, Palm Springs, so if you guys find yourselves oh, in the desert. conveniently located in <laughs> Palm <laughs> Springs. We're performing in Palm Springs. <laughs> I do encourage you to make a weekend of it and go. It's very, very it's funny. It's so good that I'm willing to walk around looking ridiculous all the time. Yes, so. stay away from unmarked vans. Okay. Um, I have to legally. So, you did improv for many years. True. <laughs> yes, and I enjoyed it. Yeah. I see what he did there. See what he did? Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, you are obviously a performer, but uh, thinking about the kids we just saw on the video, are there ways you feel like learning improv and other forms of comedy have helped you in your life outside of being in show business? Absolutely, uh, because I'm barely in show business. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's awesome watching that video. I was so inspired back there watching that. Um, it, you know, it's all about communicating and to empower kids to feel good enough to stand up there by yourself and speak and, and have other kids listen to you. That is such a tool that will, will help you in every facet of life. I mean, I, I, I think that every accomplishment I've ever achieved in my life, small or large, is a result of my falling in love with language as a, as a young person and, and I, to get kids to fall in love with expressing themselves and putting words together in a in a pattern in, in the musicality of that, it's a great gift. Yes, agreed. Well yeah. said. 
Thank because you. Because of your love of language. Well, <laughs> now there's a lot of pressure on me to be <laughs> <laughs> eloquent. Now, uh, as you could tell, it's very enjoyable to listen to Jeff talk, which people discovered when you were the co-host of the Totally Rad Show, which is why you have legions of fans. Uh, for those who don't know, this was a video podcast that Jeff co-created uh, right on the cusp of podcasts. Most people were still going, what's a podcast? And I was still going, what's DSL? And uh, <laughs> it became hugely popular. Tell us how that came to be and how you were so close to the zeitgeist. Oh, ah. <laughs> well, I'd been looking at the zeitgeist for a long time and pl planning and plotting. No, uh, the, um, the show really became, grew out of a friendship. It, the two of, my two other co-hosts and I became buddies and uh, right at the, the time the technology was empowering people to be able to put stuff out and iTunes was accepting podcasts and and all of a sudden, video equipment became cheap enough to use. I mean, everybody knows the story of the last, really not that long, <laughs> six or seven years. Back as, in the day. Yeah, I mean, this Deanna was, we were, what, say. about seven or eight years ago we started our show, and there were, really wasn't much in the way of video on the web at that point. I um, mean, it was right when YouTube was starting, uh, and um, we just kind of happened to be at the right place at the right time, and, and I think we, we oh talked... Uh, you know what? I've been talking to her. I should be talking okay. to you more. No, it's okay. Uh, I'm just going to work on oh, no, opening actually, yes, yes, you have a mustache on. Talk just to me. Yeah. Talk to you like a stash, huh? <laughs> Sorry, honey. Um, <laughs> Love you. Uh, anyway. <laughs> what are you doing after? <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, your show was extremely popular. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so much so that you went from being a fanboy at Comic-Con to a panelist at yeah. Comic-Con. What was it like to go to the other side of the table and have fanboys seeking you out and fangirls throwing themselves at you? And well, did anyone the, dress as you <laughs> for the convention? Um, well, the, the, uh, honestly, that was a dream come true because I, I did used to drag my mother to Comic-Con when I was oh, a kid. And, uh, no, no, she, no, what, what, she loves it. What's that about? <laughs> you don't like Comic-Con? Yes, she does. You guys, when this show takes off and you have to go to Comic-Con, you're going to be, we'll, we'll be apologizing to me. Yes. Um, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing to be able to, it was amazing to be able to be there as a, as a have a professional badge. And, and I remember the first time I got one of the, they give, everybody at Comic-Con has a little placard and a oh. Hershey kiss. That's a, whether you're J.J. Abrams or me, <laughs> you, you have uh, the same placard and a Hershey kiss. And so I, I kept the placard and I ate the kiss. <laughs> well and done. It was well, savory. Done. Uh, so now I you have a new project. Tell us what you are working yeah, on. Yeah, I just now. launched a new show on the 5x5 network called DLC. It's an audio show about uh, video games. And we just did our sixth episode this morning, actually. It's a live show, which is really cool. Uh, we have um, call in, live call ins and stuff. It's, it's great. And what's it called? DLC. DLC, sorry. I'm and sure where I can people listen to it? In Five, Palm Springs? On iTunes. <laughs> or, oh, that's, uh, that's more convenient. On, uh, really, anyway, R, it has an RSS feed. Easiest way is 5x5.tv slash DLC. You, everyone wrote that. Okay. <laughs> Good job. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for being here. We wish you the best of luck with your new show. And as you know, we're not just here to talk about how great you are. We just thought that would be polite to do before we take your money playing a game that's rigged. You didn't really do that, though. You kind of just made fun of my mustache. <laughs> I plugged all your shows, oh, yeah, Jeff. Too. What do you want from me? <laughs> and then you sympathize with my mom. You Comic -Con. <laughs> I sent positive thoughts to your mother. That's yeah. nice. Oh, that is nice. <laughs> I really should do that more often. Go ahead. Stop, Sorry. stop your delay tactics. We're taking your money. <laughs> Now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to play The, the Game, Game is Rigged! When you answer right, go ahead and grin Just keep in mind that you won't win But losing should never cause you shame Because you know we rigged the game! <laughs> they are delightful. Aren't they? they? Aren't they? I, like them. Them I like them very much. <laughs> Uh, okay, so you understand that the game you're about to play is rigged, correct? Well, I'm pretty good at games, so I think I can, I think I can win. Okay, but the point system is designed so that no matter what, you are going to lose. You understand that, right? But if I get all the questions correct, I will win. Okay, so it's called The Game is Rigged because you, you will not walk away a winner. We just want to make that clear. Got it? I'm going to win. 
Okay. Okay. So knowing that you are going to lose yes. whatever amount of money you bet, you bet. Right. How much are you willing to wager that you will win this game? I'm wagering everything that's on my person at the moment. Oh, everything that's on your person. Which is this microphone, <laughs> my shirt, and this crisp fifty dollar bill. Woo -hoo! You know what that is? That's uh, internet money. That's not, oh. that's not very much. Don't go into the internet if you want to. Go into the internet. That's a little little that's, tip. That's almost over. That's almost done. I wish done. I had more. Yeah. If I had seen the video earlier, I, I would have scrounged for more. No, I, I, no, it's it's really wonderful, and I'm happy to try to contribute, but I'm going to win, so you're okay, not going to Okay, so this it. is what's on the table. So, all right, uh, you talked a lot about movies and games on TRS, and so we thought it would be fun to play a game about movies. See what we did there? Okay, uh, so this is a game called Movie Mashups. The way it works is we will give you the plot of two existing movies combined, and you will tell us what the title of the new movie would be. For example, if I said a relationship columnist leaves her Manolos and Manhattans behind to battle Jessica Alba and Mickey Rourke in a dark, brooding metropolis that houses underworld thugs and crime bosses, you would say? Uh, the last one's Sin City. The first one is something Sin? Manolos. Sex and the Sin City, because it's a mashup of oh, a Sex so and the City overlap. and Sin City. Okay, sex yes, and that's my next line. Keep in mind, the titles are not just linked, they're mashed. Right. Got it? Got it. Okay. Are you ready? Much, much harder that way. Yeah, Got it. But you're going to lose. Still going to win. Okay, here we go. Ready? Yes. Ready. He's confident. Okay. A blind Audrey Hepburn must battle psychos Alan Arkin and Bane while one looks for hidden heroin and the other plots to destroy Gotham City? Um, well, uh, it's uh, the miracle worker and, and oh. no, okay. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, well, it's Batman. It's the Dark Knight Rises. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm afraid of the dark, uh, uh, who's afraid of the dark? What is that? Alone in the dark, <laughs> dark, wait. rise. Hang on. Let the bread wait, rise. Wait, let it come to you. Just wait. Uh, oh, wait until dark night rises. <laughs> yeah! Pretty confident I'm going to win this. That was worth one point. I got to talk it out. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm winning. You're, so far, you've got one point. Ben Stiller tries to make up for a disastrous date with Cameron Diaz, only to discover she's given birth to Satan's child. There's something about Mary's omen. <laughs> <laughs> Do you go to the movie? <laughs> Uh, there's something about Rosemary's baby was the answer we were that looking doesn't... for. Okay. So that it was right. worth ten Got points. It. That one was worth ten. So I'm ahead by so one. You're at minus nine at this <laughs> time. Yeah, it's good. This is how I do it. It's called rope a dope. <laughs> a CIA agent raises an orphan lion cub and eventually releases it into the wild while battling assassins and amnesia. <laughs> Could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> a CIA agent. Right, obviously Jack Ryan. Name and <laughs> raises an orphan lion cub and eventually releases it into the wild. Go, Elsa, go! While battling assassins and amnesia. You're no longer constrained. You are free, Willy. <laughs> obviously, obviously, because that's about lions. Anyone? The audience is. The born free identity. Yes. Born free identity. That was worth 30 points. So you oh. are at minus 30. The you thing you don't understand is that I've here. realized that the points go up, so I only have to get the last question right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, okay. Here we go. Yes. Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor play mm. a bitter married couple tormenting one another. Right. while simultaneously living the high life by ripping off stock investors. Taming of the Shrew. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Cleopatra. Um, all right. I don't know the second one. What's the, what's the second one again? Um, uh, while living the high life by ripping off stock investors. Perhaps with their friend Jonah Hill. And maybe Leo DiCaprio. Mm, right. And lots uh, of women. Everyone else has it. <laughs> uh, it is, um, I, 
I, I, I, my brain isn't working. I know the movie in the first one, but I can't oh, really think first, of it. What's the meaning of the first one? Well, I can't remember the title, which knock, is what well, the part that you want to know. How about the meaning of Knock Knock? Oh, yeah, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf of Wall Street? Yeah! Yeah! Right. <laughs> that was worth 0. 0.5 points. So, <laughs> we're at minus what? 13.5. What? Correct. Okay. Two, two more to go. <clears throat> two Mexican teenage boys and a beautiful older woman conspire to murder Danny DeVito's intimidating mother. <laughs> E2 Mambien, throw mama from the train. E2 Mambien, throw mama tambien. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Throw to mama tambien from the train. Well, uh, yes. All right. That was worth 37.5 points. Yes! We're at minus one. Oh my god, I can't believe the, the odds of that being worth exactly that amount. That is crazy. It all comes down to this. <laughs> Let's see. I'm ready. Well, all, I, all I need is one point to win, right? Or two points to win. You need 300 points to win. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is worth 301 points. Let's see. While tracking the mysterious Piranha Women tribe, Bill Maher and Mel Gibson are suddenly able to read women's minds and learn their most private thoughts. What women want is in there. What was the first part, Piranhas? While tracking the mysterious Piranha Women Tribe, Bill Maher. The mysterious Piranha Women Tribe. What you don't know is that I am an expert of Piranha Women Tribe movies. Oh. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I was scared for a second. <laughs> and uh, the answer is. Do you have an answer? Yes. Is that your answer? Uh, it's <laughs> Jaws for the revenge of what women want. <laughs> Very close, very close. Come on, it's what cannibal women in the avocado jungle of death want. <laughs> We've all seen that, right? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, that so one was close. worth 301 points, so now you're at minus 302. I'm sorry, Jeff, I'm afraid. No, oh, let me I'm write it. You did not win, and you will be donating that $50. I do hope that you're not too disappointed, because after all, the game, the game was, was rigged. rigged. You've lost the game, you'll pay the price. But losing never felt so nice. Your reputation bears no stain because your loss is... Aim and Cannon Comedy Project at Inner City Arts' is game. game! Yay! One more time for Jeff Kanata, ladies and gentlemen. He's been a great sport. Let him hear it. Thank you. Altanovich, Danny Klein Modisset, and Maz Jobrani. And we will be raising money for Mothers Fighting for Others, so we look forward to seeing you then. Please, another round of applause for the Strip Mall Debutant. <laughs>